Good morning. Good morning. My name is David Lamb, and it is my great honor that this morning I get to welcome you to the worship of our Lord here at Sterling Heights United Methodist Church. Today is the third day of March, and this is the third Sunday after Lent. And uh, welcome all of you. I do want to emphasize one announcement, but that's because it's so important that you all remember it. Um, next weekend is the time change, so you need to set your clocks an hour ahead, and if you fail to do that, you'll be walking in at the end of the service next week instead of at the beginning. So please remember to change your clocks next week. Um, I look around and I see that we are all family this morning, but that is good. Family is good, and we know, of course, that where two or three are gathered in his name, there Jesus is also. And the Holy Spirit is in our midst, helping us to worship the Lord, our Savior, and our Father in heaven. So, as we come now to worship, please stand if you are able to do so, and join me in our responsive call to worship. In the midst of our failures, we stand in God's grace. In the midst of our struggles, we boast in our hope through Christ. In the midst of our suffering, we claim the endurance given by the Holy Spirit. In every part of our lives, the love of our divine Creator has been poured into our hearts. Let us be open to this love as we join together in worship.
I would like to remind you that in your bulletin there is an insert with some prayer concerns listed on it. You're invited to take this sheet home with you and use it during the week as you pray. Looking over the sheet, I see that we have two new names on the sheet from for this week. Judy Brownlee, our own dear sister and member, is uh, having failing health, and she is on the sheet and in desperate need of prayers. And then Baby Hazel, um, a young child friend of Barb Valade's upcoming cancer surgery. Uh, all right then. Thank you so much, Brother Lamb. Good to see you all this morning. <coughs> Amen. Um, I'm going to try not to uh, get too excited when I preach because I might go into a coughing attack if I do that. I don't know. So, but I'm so so uh, glad to be back here with you. I've missed you all very very much, and um, it's good to to see your angelic faces, amen. Um, <clears throat> certainly, um, certainly uh, we are blessed to be in our third Sunday in Lent. And um, I believe by next week, we should have our website up. I can sit back with that, of course, with my illness and all. Uh, but we do have some people from our congregation that have done some meditations. So, I will be excited to go on there and uh, hear some voices other than Pastor Ed's. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to that taking place um, probably by the by a week from from now. Um, and then also um, there will be uh, sermons from when I first started, so that when others come onto the website, they can start there, and we'll have a queue and keep on going up. So we're looking forward to expanding our ministry and our and our, our reach. Let us bow our heads. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our holy congregation. We thank you for being in our midst and for being with us, Lord God, wherever we go, that we can, can be here in Sterling Heights, we can be on the other side of the world, we can be anywhere, Lord God, and you are not only with us, but you're a step ahead of us, Lord, protecting us, guarding us and guiding us and leading us. And so we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the ways in which you protect us, the ways in which you hear our prayers and heal us. Uh, Lord, we continue to lift up Judy. We pray for her, Lord God. We pray for her continued strength, protection, as well as for her children, Lord. Oh Lord, we are so grateful for those who've helped others in need of transportation, uh, who've just been there. And Lord, that's what the church is about. It's an extended family, knowing that you're never alone, that there's always somebody there for you. It's what I love so much about this church. This is such a great church because there is such sincerity and love in this church. And we thank you for that extended love. Uh, Lord, there are those who are going into the hospital. We lift up Louise, we lift up Steve, and also my brother Kevin as well. Lord, all are going into surgery and are in need of your angels of healing and protection. We pray that you would give them peace. We pray that you would govern the minds and the hands of the doctors so that everything, Lord God, would come out to perfection. And Lord Jesus, uh, we just... Uh, continue to pray for the continued health in our congregation. Uh, we're coming out of the winter, going into the spring, and with the temperature changes and all of that, sometimes the body has adjust. So just be a step ahead of us with that as well. So Lord God, we are grateful for what you're doing, for what you're, you've done, and what you're going to do. Because of your faithfulness, we know that you will be with us. Bless us and protect us. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.
I had a pastor once years ago who used to point out that people sometimes maybe don't give very much in the offering plate because they figure their little bit isn't going to make much of a difference. So why should they even bother? It's easy to think that we just don't have enough and that it really isn't worth it. This pastor would then say, well, <coughs> if you feel that way, obviously you just aren't giving enough. You don't need to give till it hurts. You need to give till it feels good, till you feel like you're actually making enough of a difference for it to be worth your putting that money in. If you don't think it's making a difference, you're not challenging yourself enough. So give more. Up the giving till it starts to feel good and you know you're making a difference. That's the challenge. God wants us to be joining him in this work, in this ministry and kingdom building. And if you don't think that your little bit is helping, give more. Thank you. Lord God, that have been given unto you. Lord, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would multiply them. And we pray that you would use them as instruments for the healing of this world. And bless these gifts in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the letter to the Romans, the fifth chapter, reading out of the New International Version. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Lamb, for the reading of the scripture. Again, good to see you all here this morning. Amen. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do because football season's over. Amen. <laughs> and uh, you guys know I'm a bit of a football fan. And, you know, it's always bittersweet for some when the season is over, especially all of those teams, those 32 teams, because at the end there's only one ultimate winner, it seems. And, you know, when you interview the coaches and the players of the winning team, 
you kind of hear the same thing almost every year. They say it's the best feeling ever. If we could, all, I, all we want to do now is just work to get back to this experience because it's just the most amazing feeling to know that you overcame and made it all the way. And the other thing you kind of hear is they'll say, you know, we worked so hard, all of that hard work over the springtime and the summer and, you know, all of the suffering that we went through, it was so difficult, but it was worth it in the end. And it makes us just want to do it all over again. And, you know, I think one reason why uh, people can gravitate towards sports and my brother had to acclimate me to that because, as you know, I was really always a nerd. He was the sports guy. So, But eventually I began to understand why people like it because it is a reflection of life that, you know, in life there's hardships. In life uh, it's, it's not an a, a autobahn. It's not a freeway. It's a motocross. You know, you, you're hitting bumps and you're hitting pits and you have to navigate it and it's a challenge. But if you get over the mountain, it is so worth it. And so when you have that victory, it is thrilling. But how much more thrilling is the victory of spiritual success? How much more exhilarating is it to know that you have indeed overcome. Well, in our series on the path to divinity, it's really about that journey. It's about navigating the challenges of life to become more like God. Of course, we are Christians. We profess to be Christians. And that really has two meanings. It can mean that we are little Christs, Christians, all right? So we're like children of God. But it also means that we are aspiring to become more like Christ. So as Christians, what are we uh, saying that we are attempting to do in our life? That we would walk this life the way Jesus did. That we would do everything that we can to live the kind of life that Jesus led. And that can be an audacious claim. It's kind of like, you know, uh, having a um, 2 and 14 team and saying you're going to go to the Super Bowl, right? It's a big chasm between the frailties of humanity and being like Christ. But this is the challenge that has been given us that in the short time here on this earth that we would choose to walk a godly life of holiness. Well, what does that mean? divinity. Well, you look at the life of Christ and what did he do? He brought peace. He was the prince of peace. He brought healing, whether that's mental, spiritual, emotional, or physical healing. He brought light, which was understanding where there was darkness. He brought unity where there was division, but he also brought some divisions that needed to happen. He was like a winnowing fork. He was an anchor to the future. To pull us up to a higher place. And therefore if we are being Christians. And we're being Christ like. And we're walking in holiness. And we are pursuing divinity. Then we might not be doing that for the entire world. But we're doing it in our world. That we are bringing, being light bearers in our world. We are being promoters of healing and promoters of peace and promoters of understanding. You're being that person to sit by another, to be that comforting presence, to be that listening ear, to be that resounding board and reflection of the character of Christ where they can find the peace and the understanding and the connection with God that they might not find otherwise. That we can look at the world and we can blame the world and we can criticize the world and we can get angry at the world or we can try to make a difference in the world. And if we are going to be so audacious to go for the great prize in life, then we have to boldly stand up and choose to be the agents of God that he's called us to be in this world. But of course, it's not easy to win. It's a challenge. 
it's designed to be that way. That even though it's attainable, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And so God has designed things in such a way that the glory of God would have opportunities in your life to become manifest. That the sufferings of life, as difficult as it might be to begin to even contemplate this, but the sufferings of this life are here for a reason. And I've heard theologians, I've heard some of my professors really balk at that. They don't like the idea of there being purpose in suffering. I've heard them say, we just need to do away with suffering. Well, yes, we need to do everything we can to be healers in this world to reduce the suffering But that doesn't mean that God isn't using the suffering for a purpose if you are called. And so what we want to do is be people who do not run from adversity. Who do not try to flee discomfort just for our own personal comfort. Because the enemy is not dumb. And he is going to create walls of conflict, of, of, of discomfort that will be between you and the opportunity of the manifestation of his glory in your life. And there's an illustration that Henry Nouwen gave, uh, uh, gave, many know it, but it's appropriate here. And it really shines light on the challenge that we have as Christians to push through suffering so that we can reach this place where we're really in the presence of God, where we have his joy. And in the illustration that he gave, there's a grandfather and his son, and I mean grandson, and they're at this creek and they're doing some fishing. And they're just having a wonderful time. And then the grandfather looks down. He can reach into the rock. So it's a pretty shallow creek area that they're just doing some little fishing and just having a good time. And he sees a crawfish that's struck, that's uh, stuck between two rocks. And so he reaches out to dislodge the crawfish. And when he does... The crawfish does what crawfish do, which is snatches his finger, right? And he snaps at it, and the grandfather recoils, kisses his finger, and says, ow. And the boy says, granddaddy, are you okay? And he says, I'm fine. And then he reaches back down into the water. And he reaches for the crawfish again, tries to come from behind, But of course, you know, they got eyes that go everywhere, right? So with the the other claw, he snaps him again. Ow! Grandson looks at him like, are you okay? He says, I'm fine. And then he starts to reach again, and the grandson says, Dad, granddaddy, stop. He says, don't you realize that that crawfish is going to snap you a third time? He says, he snapped you the first time. He snipped and snapped at you the second time. Why on God's green earth would you reach down a third time to try to dislodge the crawfish? The grandfather looked at his grandson and said, grandson, it is the crawfish's nature to snap at whatever comes toward it. But it is my nature to seek and to save. And I am not going to allow the crawfish's nature to change my nature. And I would submit to you that the challenge of our Christian life is to not let the snapping of people, to not let the disdain and the disappointments, to not let the shame and and the uh, discrediting and 
uh, the human need that we have to be accepted to get in the way from the godly call that we have to seek and to save. That real joy comes from aligning with the character of God. But when we're in this world, people will blame you and they will shame you and they will disenfranchise you. And, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a wicked place that we're in. And it can get to the point where you just want to pull back and sometimes you're just glad to be alone, you know. But if we do that, we are letting the nature of the world change who we are called to be and who we are. It takes courage to reach out. And sometimes the ones who wound us the most and the deepest are those who are closest to us. The people that we love can sometimes be the people who can hurt us the most. But do we have the courage to return a snap with grace? Do we have the strength to re repel darkness with light? The challenge is to hold fast to what God has promised us by being faithful in our calling. And we have to remember how blessed we are because the Holy Spirit has been poured out to us. The prophet Joel talked about this. Says, Joel 2, beginning at verse 25. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locusts have eaten. The hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is none else and my people shall never again be put to shame. And that's the scripture where he says that the young men will dream dreams and, and the, the spirit will be poured out even on the servants. And he's talking about now what he's saying is this. Is that the adversity, the suffering that we usually experience in this life is some form of loss. Loss of what we've sacrificed for, loss of what we've worked for, loss of our reputation and the perception of our character in our community. That those are the deepest losses. And so you see this theme, particularly in the Old Testament, of being put to shame, put to shame. And it's meaning that the suffering that we are often trying to avoid is being put to shame. But what the prophet Joel here is saying is that when we trust in him, we will never be put to shame. But he says something a little startling that I started off the sermon with. He says that the locust he sent. In other words, the adversity, the suffering, the loss that was experienced, God sent it. And we don't want to accept that sometimes. But what we also have to realize is that if we are trusting in him, then God is burning up stuff that needs to get burnt up. And if we have the courage to hold on to our Christian character, if we have a Super Bowl that we've set our eyes on and we're willing to hold on to that destination and we're going to push on toward it, even when it doesn't feel good, then what happens is that is how God forms the Christian character in us to really make us genuinely like him. It is the ability 
to stand firm in the character of God when it feels good and when it doesn't feel good. That proves our authenticity in him. I've heard a saying, if, if you don't stand for something, then you're going to fall for anything, right? <laughs> I heard another person say, he was asking some famous person, he said, what's the key to success? And the famous person said, I don't know what the, the key to success is, but I do know what the key to failure is, trying to please everybody. You, know, you, you need to take a stand for something. And when you do, somebody's not going to like it. But if you know what's standing for right, you have the peace of God in your heart. And that is more precious than being accepted by everybody. So Jesus took a stand. You know, when you look at his life, he must have been fit because he was always running. Amen. You know, he'd be in one place and it says he barely escaped. The Pharisees were going to, he, he escaped because this time had not yet come. I mean, they were, they were after him. And so it's not going to be easy taking a stand. But in the end, people will respect you. That you were not wishy-washy. And that you did it in peace. You did it in love. But you did it consistently. And you did it firmly. And so in the scripture that was read. We see this process of. Choosing the joy. The joy over the happiness. I think I may have said it previously. But if I haven't. You know. Happiness is external. It's what's happening. But the joy is internal. The happiness is what we see. The joy is who we are. And there is this very fine line. Because it's so important for us to do good. It's so important for us to do all those things I said up front. To be the agents of light and peace and healing and what have you. But you see, the enemy, he is slick. He's clever. And with just a few tweaks, he can get us out of a place where we are becoming Christians. You see, the reason is this. God knows your heart. And I've got news for you. Why you do what you do is more important than what you do. He knows why you do it. And what the enemy do, will do is get you consumed in the what rather than the why. And as valuable as all of you are and we all are and as important as we all are, I've got news for you. If you don't do what God has called you to do, he'll raise up somebody else to do it. If he's got a message for you to give and you won't give it, he'll, the rocks will cry out. You see, we are the beneficiaries by being agents of God, by being givers of what God has put in us out into others. We benefit as much as the recipients. It is to God's glory and to our purification and our Christian edification that we participate in the program of God by taking advantage of every opportunity he gives us to have your testimony ready. To be able to bring another, another person into the family of God and to help disciple them and grow them up in the ways of Christ. That's the calling of every Christian. And so what does the scripture say here? In Romans 5, beginning at verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him. We have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We, in the midst of the suffering, rejoice in the hope of what's going to come. That's where the joy comes from. And he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And then he gives the reason why. Why would we have joy in the midst of 
all these different types of, of discomforts, or that word actually means adversity. It says, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And get this, and hope does not put us to shame. So it's a step-by-step -step process to reaching a place where you're never put to shame. And why is that? Because if you have that internal joy and it's been purified through adversity because you've held on to it in the midst of the adversity, you haven't returned the railing for the railing, you've given room for, for God's wrath, you've been consistent and continue to pursue righteousness when you see it and don't see it, when it feels good and you don't feel good. That is how the character develops. But being able to do that requires endurance. But when you reach that point, what happens is this. People will try to put you to shame and you won't feel shamed. You'll have peace. You'll have peace because you know who you really are. You see, there's the shame that others can attempt to place on us, but there's the real shame in knowing whether or not we have offended God. And when we know that we are in union with God, when we are right with God, that is where your peace comes from. That is where your joy comes from. And that is where you become a person who is never put to shame. So the suffering of this world is an attempt to put us to shame, to make you wrong, to make you bad, to separate you. But when we are one with him, then we will never be put to shame. So my beloved, as we continue in Lent, this path to divinity, I don't know if you're still eating your candy bars and your meringue pies. I don't know if you are or not. I hope you enjoy them if you are. Very, very good. But if you're denying yourself in some way, remember that it is simply a reminder that as Christians, we daily should be taking up our cross. Daily choosing to deny ourselves that we might receive a greater joy, a greater reward, a priceless gift, the gift of becoming more like God. Amen.
Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, you delivered us from the slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given unto you. Do this in remembrance of me, the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, broken on Calvary's cross. Take, and I eat it at this time. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. After he blessed it, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is the blood of the New Testament, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross for your sins, my sins, sins of the whole world, taken at your hand. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died, died. Christ, Christ is risen, risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us together pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time ask that you would stand for our closing hymn, Thanks Be to You Forever.
Dear Lord God, we thank you for the adversity on the path to divinity because we know, Lord God, that as long as we choose to rejoice in our sufferings, we will gain endurance, character, and hope that will not disappoint us and lead us into a place of never being put to shame. And now unto him who has blessed you in your coming here, unto him who has spoken to your heart, mind, and soul, while we worship amongst these holy walls, may he rest, may he rule, and may he abide with you, now, henceforth, and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Amen.